Hello everyone, my name is Krzysztof Słonka and welcome to Service Mesh Failure Stories at Scale. This is where it all began. It's the 24th of June 2019, it's almost midday. I am the engineer on call and I'm about to carry out the biggest deployment of my career. I've dealt with large systems in the past, but usually I was responsible for a couple of microservices. This time is different. Allegro consists of around 800 microservices running in 5000 instances. And to carry out this deployment, I'll have to redeploy every single one of them. My team knows how things can go south very quickly when they're not under control. So I've come prepared. I have a panel that allows me to deploy a specific service, a batch of services, or just enable the deployment with the new version. Our service mesh based on Envoy and a homegrown control plane has been running in for months in our dev and test environments, and we are pretty sure we fixed all of the problems that we found there. So everything should be all right, yeah? The deployment was going smoothly. We've quickly hit a thousand instances, then 2000 and a bit. More and more services were being migrated. I've encountered a couple of small bumps like reviving a dead service and some 500 errors here and there, but overall everything went well. After a couple of hours, everything was done. I felt a big relief. The website was up and running, there were no messages on our emergency Slack channel. Everything seems fine. But is it? Is it really over? Close, but no cigar. The next day we've got some reports of apps dying because of out of memory errors, some connections being rejected. And when we found out that we disabled some parts of our monitoring platform, we had to abort the mission and roll back. So, what actually went wrong with that deployment? I will solve this mystery in 30 minutes, but before I do that, <clears throat> let's focus on how did we get to this place. To answer that question, we have to go back even further, to the summer of 2018. At that time, I'm a relatively new software engineer in Allegro. Allegro is the 10th biggest e-commerce platform in the world. You can buy pretty much everything there. I'm a part of a team operating at the edge of business software and the technical platform. We provide libraries and services that allow other business teams to focus on developing features. Our most prominent responsibility is service discovery. The mechanism is implemented in a set of common libraries. So when an application wants to communicate with another application, it uses a special protocol called service. The HTTP interceptor that we register will figure out where that service is located by, communicated, by communicating with our uh, discovery backend, which is console and send the traffic to that destination. It will also have to figure out, figure out things like, should I send this traffic to a canary instance? Is this an isolated environment? Should I do weighted load balancing? Okay, so why are we even thinking about service mesh? Our main pain points today are, to change anything in the routing mechanism, we have to implement that change in the common library and then wait for all of the clients to upgrade. And that can take a lot of time. Services that do not use JVM have to re-implement every change that we do there in their own libraries and they have to follow a microservices contract. And MTLS is only implemented on JVM and we have a growing ecosystem and we'd like to support uh, some other tech stacks. Knowing all of that, 
we decided that we want some sort of a service mesh solution. We have a couple more requirements. We run most of our jobs and applications on Mesos and our Kubernetes adoption is just starting. We have some applications and jobs running on VMs, so we need to support that as well. Our discovery backend is console, so we need to integrate with it. Knowing the requirements and limitations, we set out to evaluate all of the solutions that are available on the market. We started with Istio. It is very popular and backed by a big company. Unfortunately, there was no native support for Mesos and the console integration did not scale at that point in time. Next, we looked at Linkerd, but this was also a pass for us. In version one, the data plane was written in Scala, so higher memory footprint and GC poses uh, put us off, and the version two was Kubernetes only. Console Connect would play very nicely with our current setup, but due to limited control, uh, traffic control features, we, uh, that meant we couldn't use it. The last thing we looked at was Rotor by Turbine Labs. Uh, it was no longer maintained and the console integration also didn't scale. So none of the things that we looked at really fulfilled all of our needs. So we decided to build our own solution. As the data plane, we chose Envoy, mostly because of good performance, big and active community, and hot reloading feature that we needed for our VMs. And we decided to write the control plane ourselves. We used Java control plane as our base and wrote all of the features that we needed in Kotlin and released it in open source as Envoy control. We know why we want to build a service mesh. We know what the requirements are, but how, how are we going to do this? Our strategy is quite simple. We have to change two things in our applications, how the app is receiving and sending out requests. The first part is quite easy. When an app is in deployed, there is a hook that registers it in console. And after that, uh, the application can accept traffic. What we would like to do is to inject Envoy into that deployment and change the registration port and voila! Now Envoy is proxying all of the incoming traffic. The second part is a bit more complicated. The most widespread approach is to use IP tables and route all of the outgoing traffic to the proxy. But the team that's responsible for Mesos had, has had really bad experience with network isolation there, mostly kernel panics. This is a graph I showed before illustrating how outgoing requests are made. We've decided to do this on the application level. So in our common library, we intercept all of the traffic, just like before, and route it to Envoy. And then Envoy will know where to send the request. This has a couple of drawbacks. Our clients have to upgrade once more and other software stacks have to re-implement it. But it is a relatively small change to add a proxy to an HTTP client. And this does not prevent us from using the transparent approach on Kubernetes. So having both incoming and outgoing traffic go through Envoy, we can think about implementing other things like MTLS and airbag rules. Now that we know the context, we can go back to the first deployment I described in the beginning and the problems that occurred after it. I'm going to group similar problems together and talk about each group in detail. I call the first group of problems, there are three types of lies. lies them lies and stats. First, I'm going to tackle the memory issue that was reported a day after the deployment. The consequence of our setup is that Envoy's memory usage is a part of the total memory used by the app. Before the deployment, we measured and verified 
that additional memory would not cause any problems. So according to Envoy's server memory allocated, the biggest Envoy instance used less than 30 megabytes. But in reality, for most apps, it's more than 100 megabytes. This was enough to tip some of the apps over the edge and cause out of memory errors. It turned out that there was a proposal in Envoy to report memory statistics for all subsystems, but it was never fully finished. Before I talk, the next thing, I talk about the next thing, I have to explain what a hot restart is for those of you unfamiliar with Envoy. A hot restart is a full binary reload of Envoy without losing any connections. It is very useful for our VMs because we can't afford any downtime in critical systems that we are running there. After investigating that feature uh, in our setup, we found out that there are some gauges that reported inconsistent active connection values after a hot restart. This troubled us for a bit because we thought that we were leaking connections somewhere. But it turned out that it actually was a bug so we reported it and I'm glad to tell you that it's been fixed in the newest version of Outboy. So what have you learned from that? It's important to measure and check critical things by yourself. Do not completely trust a new system. Measure critical metrics at the OS level if you can. The next section describes how Envoy changes the way requests and connections are made. So, when there is a proxy, uh, when there is no proxy in between the services and you're trying to make a new connection and there's nothing uh, listening on the other end, you will get a connection refuse. But when there is a proxy in between, you'll always be able to establish the connection to the proxy but the proxy will return 503 error with no healthy upstream. This is the most basic change that occurs when you introduce a proxy. Let's dig a little bit deeper. What are some other things that can change? Default timeouts, for example. When service A wants to communicate with service B and sets a two minute timeout on the response and the service B responds after 30 seconds, or 90 seconds, everything is all right. When you throw in a proxy in the middle of it and it has a different timeout set, then the request will fail and the proxy will return an error. When we were back on production, we learned that there were some services that take more than five minutes to respond and with proxy in place, those requests timed out. Timeouts are a bit more complicated than that. If you set the same value in your application and the proxy, then for a brief moment, when the connection is being closed, you might see a proxy trying to send data over an already closed connection. Envoy can also delay closing the connection. So in some cases, if you have very sensitive health checks, it can make them fail. And that's not all. There are so many types of timeouts. Connection, stream, route. How to configure them? One of my teammates created a repository breaking down most of the cases that we encountered in our production environment with an example in a Docker file so you can play around with it. A good rule of thumb is to set a default red tree on those kind of arrows but you need to make sure that you only retry on idempotent requests. So head, get, put. Beware of Istio here. By default, it also retries post requests. The next thing that also beat us during the deployment was the max connection limit, which is 1024 in Envoy by default. That was way too low for some of our applications ingress running on Mesos. And here we discover some more things that could get us in trouble. Our all limits are set per Envoy worker. 
and by default Envoy will start with as many workers as it has CPUs. So if you are making an outgoing connection to a service that has a hundred endpoints and you run it on 64 core machine and leave the default timeout, that means if you get a burst of traffic, you can open up to 6 million connections, which is not good. And remember, connections are sockets, which are file descriptors, which are finite. So when deploying service mesh, we unconsciously increase the number of descriptors created and hit a global limit. To combat that, we implement in our control plane a check that would set the connection type to HTTP2. If we detected that both sides of the request can handle it. This cannot be done automatically. This is because Envoy only works with HTTP2 in prior knowledge mode. It does not support protocol upgrade. This was also a big factor in our decision not to proxy traffic to external domains like vendor APIs and second factor being Envoy not supporting the connect method at that time. Okay, so after the deployment, we are able to reduce the number of connections by a thousand, uh, a hundred uh, thousand in the first 20 minutes of the deployment. Another group of errors from Envoy came from Envoy being really strict with the HTTP protocol. So it will lowercase all of the headers. And we knew about it, but we still got caught by surprise in some places. For example, some header sanitizers were case sensitive and stopped working. It will also merge multiple headers with the same name into a comma separated list. And it does not tolerate forbidden combinations of headers. For example, Undertow and CoaJS in some older versions can produce uh, responses with transfer encoding chunked and content length headers. So Envoy will reject that response and return an, a 503 error. To sum everything up, I think that transparent proxies are not that completely transparent. There are so many factors that a proxy influences and to get everything right you have to be able to fine-tune the settings to each application in the ecosystem. As I mentioned before we, <coughs> we decided to write our own control plane. It gave us a lot of flexibility but we, it also meant that we had to be really careful not to introduce any errors to the current discovery mechanism. If there's a bug in there, it means no traffic flowing between our, uh, in our mesh and that, we, that means we are in big trouble. For the most part, we did a good job, but there were a couple of bumps along the way. Let's first look at the control plane architecture. Our discovery backend is console. We pull state from there, process it and then push the configuration to Envoy. And Envoy will communicate with local instances within a single DC. We also have a synchronization mechanism between our control planes, so we can fall back to another DC when instances of a service are not available there. The first serious issue that we faced was when Envoy uh, was being stuck in the warming phase indefinitely. This means that there are no updates to the cluster state applied, which means no traffic flowing after a service changes its IP address. It took us a lot of time to figure it out and it turned out that our base project, Java Control Plane, did not send the updates in the specified order. XDS protocol requires that EDS and RDS updates are triggered after CDS and LDS. We also found out that if Envoy disconnects from one control plane, and connects to another instance of control plane, we might not send all of the resources that are needed. And that might also cause the warming state as well. Fortunately, we've patched all of these problems in open source and we haven't seen them since. The second issue that stalled our development for a while was poor performance of the control plane. 
especially with regards to services that have a lot of cluster definitions. A couple of people spent considerable amount of time applying the following optimization. Our synchronization mechanism was not good with flapping instances. When an instance appears and disappears, suddenly we would regenerate a lot of resources. On this graph, you can see time spent in GC before and after the deployment of an improved version. In some cases, we regenerate parts of the Envoy config when it was needed. On this graph, you can see CPU usage before and after. And this graph shows an average percentage of CPU usage of Envoy. Remember, before it was control planes metrics. Our test services would trigger a lot of unnecessary changes, which meant a lot of traffic and CPU spike on Envoy that had a lot of cluster definitions. I would like to focus on this one because I think it's a great uh, engineering practice. In our infrastructure, we have a couple of so-called test apps that are constantly being deployed and scaled to see how fast the information from our discovery backend is available in Envoy. If we see a rise in that metric, we know that something is wrong with the new version of our control plane. In this screenshot, you can see spawn first instance time. There are also spawn next instance time, scale down and so on. If you remember way back in the beginning, I told you that we disabled some parts of the monitoring system. I do not want to get into the details, but if the monitoring platform had a test app like this, that would test if metrics are reported and alerts are triggered, we would know about the problem sooner than in production environment. The last thing, but still very important, is that we created resilience tests. They verify that if some parts of our system are unavailable, meaning the control plane cannot reach its local console agent, there is no leader in the console cluster, or Envoy disconnects and tries to reconnect, the system behaves in a predictable manner and will self-heal after the outage is done. And there is nothing special about these tests. They use JUnit framework and can be simply run from a laptop or CI. The test gave us a couple, uh, saved us a couple of times from introducing bugs that would lead to bigger outages stemming from small instabilities. To summarize, writing a control plane is hard. If you decide to do that, use a base project like Go Control Plane or Java Control Plane and contribute to those projects if you find any problems. Also, write test services that constantly test your product. This is a great way to make sure you discover problems before your clients do. Do this, of course, uh, this is of course another layer of protection right after unit, integration and end-to-end -end test that you should write. Okay, so what's happening right now? Currently, we are running strong in productions. Most of the problems I described are long gone and we are pushing 1 million RPS in our mesh. We are bound to break that barrier really soon. So, looking back at more, looking back at more of the, uh, more, more than a year of work, what could have been done differently? Maybe we could have gone into console connect and work with the vendor to try to extend system where we need it. Maybe we should have focused on our migration to Kubernetes and then go with Insta instead. We may never know what would have been better. Okay, so what's in the future for us? In a couple of uh, weeks, we are introducing MTLS and airbag mechanism to our service mesh, and it's a culmination of months of work. I will definitely blog about it once we are in production environment because I think we did a great job designing the migration process. I think now is a good time to thank all of the people who worked on Service Mesh in Allegro. Piotr, 
Dariusz, Łukasz, Patryk, Łukasz, Marcin and Andrzej. Thank you very much for all of your hard work. So, if you only remember three things from this talk, please remember this. Service mesh deployment should be gradual and rollback should be easy. Transparent proxies are tricky and not completely transparent. Service mesh is hard, so do, the, do a lot of testing. Thank you very much for listening. That's all from me. If you have any questions, I'm glad to answer them.